there was a, a great comment, um, Peter, I don't know if you saw in the chat from another Peter, Peter McConnell, just about what um, in this kind of reflects what I said about the different um, angles will be coming from it, um, you know, with all of us, all these groups coming together. And he was saying that he's found internal auditors are looking and supporting quantification of risks um, since it appears they're absent um, in the alignment with the company objectives. And of course, we see that misalignment and we've talked about that. So I don't know, Peter, do you want to address that or, or did you have something else you wanted to, to talk about before we got into more of the Q and A? Well, I, I, um, I started my career at uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, um, the Chase Manhattan side as uh, head of internal audit. So I can certainly relate to that comment. Um, I'm not going to be particularly uh, flattering about internal audit because um, enormous gaps have opened up in the various bodies that should be closely interacting on these kinds of issues, which includes internal audit. Um, I'll make a bold statement and say I was particularly distressed at internal audit accepting a label third line of defense. Um, my philosophy is that I don't want to be the third line of anything. So uh, if we could achieve one thing, perhaps we should start getting rid of those labels. In fact, um, my CEO at the time would have said, you know, you're not the third line of defense, you're the first line of attack. If you don't tell us what's going on in this organization, who will? So I think there is, um, I, I think for internal audit, there's a significant ground to cover. But similar to financial auditing, if we can frame risk within a common measurement framework, then I think the role of internal audit is going to become vastly clearer. Um, I, I, can, I can well understand how difficult it must be auditing in this environment when you're looking at hugely complex, uh, complex risks that are escalating at a rate of knots and you're, you're, you're the third line of defense. So um, I look forward to certainly engaging with, uh, with internal auditors in this whole initiative. Yeah, we'll put, I mean, through my engagement, we find, in fact, just this morning, we had, um, as you know, our CROs forum um, meets regularly, and you've come to talk to our CEOs, and, and as well as to, to, in, in a joint discussion with the premier CROs, and we had a speaker about um, talking about cyber risk, and when we got onto the three lines, a lot of the CROs were just talking about that, that they play a role in today's world with, with things like cyber, you know, it's, it's they're across all three lines and how the organizational structure is changing in that respect in terms of being able to detect these emerging risks. And as we're talking about right now, being able to um, quantify and, and, and account for those properly. So I do think internal audit is, as you said, going through a massive sea change. And we do see some members who are head of internal audit, I see their titles even being changed. I don't know if anyone on the call who comes from internal audit would like to maybe elaborate on that a little bit more and what they're doing in terms of quantifying the risks. Yeah, I totally agree with what you were saying, Peter. There's a huge gap between an internal audit and the, and the position that they're taking on uh, you know, risk accounting and quantification of uh, <clears throat> risk. I've seen that in my own experience at a large uh, software implementation at a, at, at a company where a risk associated with scheduling, scope, uh, a cost were not being um, uh, addressed from a, a quantification perspective, more addressed from a qualitative and how is the scope, for example, uh, going to, uh, how's that, that scope going to affect the, uh, the scheduling of the project, but not looking at a, a quantification of that so they can align it with well, if, if the scope is going to if it's going to be added scope, what's the cost of that? What's the additional risk? If the scheduling is uh, being changed, what's the you know the cost of that? And uh, quantitatively and, and and qualitatively on the objectives of uh, of achieving uh, the, the uh, you know finishing and achieving the the uh, the project under the original requirements. And so this is presenting huge risks to the organization and multi-million dollar projects that uh, they get in. And, and then there's a disconnect between uh, the management of that project, the executives and the board understanding uh, the risks. And so they end up at some 
part in the project when there's a delay, the vendor can't qu uh, quick, uh, quickly uh, address it, which adds to scope, which adds to schedule, which adds the cost. And now a multi-million dollar project has gone, exploded and gone beyond. And the board is looking back at management all the way down and saying, well, what happened here? Why didn't we know this? Yeah, that sounds familiar, doesn't it, Peter? Um, it, it certainly does. Um, I mean, you look at uh, some of the um, corporate failures and um, you, you mentioned Enron, for example, Rachel. Um, and I, I have to come back to the fact, as Peter just uh, illustrated, if there were, if we could rebalance the, the focus between the quantitative and the qualitative, we, we'd have um, much more effective boards. Um, I think there'd be a far greater incisiveness in decision-making uh, and auditing would improve because if, um, if you had, if you have a situation where you, you, quanti you have a, a methodology for quanting non-financial risk and valuing non-financial risk, and let's face it, um, the, the opportunity cost of holding massive uh, operational risk reserves, I mean, it's colossal, uh, but we don't account for it, which uh, you know always struck me as a little odd. But if we can balance that quantitative and the qualitative, um, I think we, we find a great, you know, a, a, a surge in effectiveness in what boards do and how effective they can be. Um, if I can just roll in another topic, risk appetite. Um, it, I, it always defeated me how we could uh, effectively use a concept like risk appetite, which is a, a very critical uh, concept without a common measurement framework, you know, wrapped around it. So I think all these elements, you know, come together, but it is at, at its core has to be a universally adopted method of quantifying and aggregating exposure to operational risk or non-financial risk. And I think what's really interesting from a practical point of view, as, as both Peters have pointed out, is the fact that the boards in the past really haven't had that kind of, that, that level of um, expertise or knowledge, shockingly, um, in terms of driving it. Um, the, the genesis, if, if I can go back to, to the origins of the, the methodology, the quantification methodology, it wasn't in risk management, it was in operations management. Because if we go back to the 80s, early 90s, uh, certainly the bank I was, uh, I was at went through a massive consolidation, you know, operational and technology consolidation. So we went from, I don't know, dozens of distributed operations and system centers into two technology hubs. And these two technology hubs pointed straight at our chief operating officer in New, in New York. And he basically had no, in, no management information to manage the huge concentrations of operational risk have been, that have been created through that strategy. Um, what was done at the time was uh, to implement um, uh, risk indicators, um, key risk indicators, and um, risk and control self-assessment. And our chief operating officer, you know, kind of suffered. I mean, he was hugely jealous of the market risk executives and credit risk executives that had their dashboards. But what our chief operating officer had was traffic light reports. And um, stating the obvious, you can't compare and aggregate colors. So um, at the time I led a project that was designed to look at the measurable properties within operational processes to see if they could be quantified and aggregated. And that was basically the genesis of what we're now calling risk accounting. Mm, well put. Steve, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I think it's kind of interesting listening to conversations about internal audit, risk, technology, etc. There's no obvious profile of the perfect risk professional. It doesn't exist. You, you've, got, you've got to be able to face in 52 different directions, you know. And I guess it, it kind of draws a, a few factors together, really, which for, from the ACCA perspective, and correct me if I'm wrong, Rachel, but our demographic profile is early 30s. 
because we've taken an awful lot of uh, relatively new accountants in in the last 10 years. We've grown dramatically. Good thing there, because they are typically uh, the digital generation. So if, if anybody can handle the, the digital side of what's going to be necessary on risk, these guys can. That's, that's great. Downside, speaking from a professional qualification perspective, is that the, the whole syllabus is so turgid. It takes five years to make a change. And in the last five years, <laughs> the, the issues that have hit all of us, you, you couldn't even spell them five years ago. Never, never mind be aware of them. Uh, so to, to me, I, I, I think there's a great opportunity, and I, I don't want to speak for you, Peter, but the Risk Advisory Board, the RASB, I think there's an opportunity there to produce basically a hybrid qualification. And it, it would have to involve an organization like ACCA to give basic accounting capability because that is pretty fundamental. The, the data guys, the, 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 the big data managers, the, the Oracles, the Amazons, the, the Microsofts, the cyber side of the technologies, uh, and, and Prima, you know, to have those sort of knowledge, those methodologies, those frameworks. That to me is the way this is just has to be solved in the future. There has to be some kind of hybrid, but recognized qualification. Well, I, I agree with you totally. I mean, I think there is definitely uh, room for a certified risk accountant, for example. Mm. Um, yeah. you know, I mean, you talk about all the different facets of risk management. There, there are different facets of uh, finance as well. I mean, I spent uh, most of my career at JP Morgan Chase in finance. And it is a colossally complex exercise. I mean, you've got to have guys who understand um, accounting policy, which is a highly intellectual exercise. You've got, got to have people who can handle vast volumes of data, complex data, and uh, bring it all together and aggregate it, you know, um, probably with the overuse of uh, spreadsheets. You've got an operations base. I mean, we had um, a um, an accounting... Uh, center, a shared service center, finance shared service center in Chase Manhattan. And these were these were techies. I mean, these were IT people. And if you if you could overlay that with, as you suggest, um, a professional qualification that you are knowledgeable and um, experienced in all these different perspectives, concentrated in one professional qualification, certified risk accounting, I think you potentially have something that will become extremely valuable to um, to organizations. Yeah, I think the beauty of that kind of approach is that this is a global issue. It does not make sense for that qualification to include, say, local tax environment because yeah. it's just too parochial. We've got to keep, if, if we're going for this hybrid qualification, it's got to be at a very high level and global because uh, uh, that way it can be reactive to how technology changes, the environment changes, et cetera. Uh, and, and that way there would be a standard, if you like, in, yeah. implemented globally because of, because of a qualification criteria. Yeah. Well, we, we, we hope to, to nurture all these aspects in, in Durham and begin to put the building blocks in place in Durham and, and where we take it from there, because, um, the Risk Accounting Standards Board, in its present form, is a research unit attached to Durham. And we've got to, I think we've got to collectively look at that and say, well, what's the best direction for this to take, assuming that all this comes together? I'll say again what I said in my opening remarks of critical importance is the engagement with CFOs, CROs, organisations that are prepared to let us go under their bonnets, uh, hoods if you're American, um, so that we can start, you know, looking at real life environments and, uh, you know, testing some of this stuff that uh, that we have tested where well, we've tested it in academia. Now we've got to see how, you know, does this uh, does it will this can this be adapted for real life operating environments so that that will be the next phase. Julian, do you? Uh... Yeah, I was about to ask Julian what his thoughts are because I think this is this is really um, 
what is exciting is being able to when you look back what every everyone all of you are saying your experience at banks and how regulatory driven the whole risk management it was a function and the risks were siloed and it was all because of the direction of of the regulators but being able to get the academics and the professionals together to research and uh, reiterate this is a research project um and it's uh and it's great just the the, the round table we have in order to try to to you know, build on this and get something um, you know, that that actually is tried and tested and works. So, Julian, go ahead. No, I, I mean, I think you know what what I, it, it's very interesting um, having this discussion and, and sort of articulating out things that we've sort of talked about internally before. Um, I mean, there, there's sort of two. Well, there's sorry, there's three aspects to to having a university and and what what the partnerships work in that way. Um, one is is sort of providing um, education support. So when we've developed an idea and developed something, because you know we all teach a lot of accounting and we also teach a lot of accredited work in both accounting and finance. So we do quite a lot of these sort of uh, qualifications, as it both for a professional and, and academic level. Second part about it is then is effectively providing the kind of um, industrial engagement and supporting sort of the, the sort of the data analytics side of things. I mean that that's obviously very important, and you know we we have the infrastructure for that. You know we have part of the largest computer system you know in the UK because we, we're one of the partners on the supercomputing systems here, so we can do all the kind of big data analytics and um, simulations and things like this. But then there's also the sort of the, the the third bit, which sometimes is usually what we talk about afterwards. But given that um, the Nobel Prize was popped out to Ben Bernanke and uh, Diamond Divig uh, the last couple of days for banking and, and understanding banking, um, there's also the theory. There's also the theoretical construction and actually gaming out how the how what you do and how those ripples ripple out into industry and then come back to you so that that gaming out that theoretical development um, is, is 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 really important because if you if you construct something which doesn't have decent theoretical foundations where you know what the edge cases will be you know what the limits are you know what happens if somebody tries to game it in in, in, in to game the metrics that you're trying to deliver and build if you have done that kind of part of that look at the incentives for doing that look at the incentive structure of reporting risk in this particular way if you spend a bit of time on that then uh that that helps a lot as you're deploying something because often we only discover these kinds of issues after something has happened okay we only discovered that the way um, special purpose vehicles could be used to you know create money pumps came after we suddenly realized that we had enron and you know uh, probably if somebody you know starts calling those sorts of sub entities after the way that they did they're having a bit of a joke at your expense and maybe we should need to actually go and have a look at those but i remember being on the ground at the time one of my uh, co former colleagues from uh, my previous institution was on the international coming from the international accounting standards board it's one of the authors of ifrs 17. um they were telling me about the panic the sheer panic that happened as enron occurred that, that, that this could actually happen, that that sort of mechanism could be used to gain that system and that what needed to be done to kind of do that. Now, consider that we might not have been able to do that, let's say that risk accounting would have fixed that problem and told us about all of the fraud that was being conducted. But if we think about the broad complex situation that we have today with all of the interactions, you know, we, we just had in the UK a flare up because of something that should have been completely benign but then created a, a problem for pension funds in the UK because of the way certain mechanisms have been implemented, not to do with the objective, but with the implementation. And that is purely an operational part. That was complexity that wasn't understood there. And, you know, we can see that in uh, a lot of people being extremely unhappy to say, hey, why is it that this boring job that you should have been very easily doing has unraveled? And the answer was nothing to do with sort of financial management, understanding the finance side of things, which is what we normally train, but literally to do with the, the, the practical implementation created uncovered risks that when we have a sudden jump in, in, in yields, then you see suddenly see a, a massive panic that requires nearly 100 billion in, in uh, investment by the Bank of England to prevent 
a cascade failure, doom slides, and these sorts of things. So those sorts of things shouldn't happen. You know, we should be able to understand that. There should be some measurement of that and the complexity is there. And I think that's why having a research unit there is, is kind of helpful, especially the big one, which is which is always good in this respect. So I'll leave it at that and pass it back no, to that you. That's really well put, Julian, and, and to, to explain that, um, because there was a question in the um, chat box about, you know, the position of IS. IASB, and I want to reiterate, and I hope Peter can um, elaborate more, that we're not here to rewrite any standards or rewrite the script. It's exactly what Julian said about researching these complexities. I mean, we've had lesson after lesson, you mentioned the derivatives and um, what's happening here in the UK with the, with the pensions um, uh, margin calls and everything, but I mean, you know, look back at the back to what we've been talking about with the 2007, 2008 with the colorized debt obligations back in the 90s with Orange County in the US. Um, and they were about not understanding how to account for these off, um, you know, these off these instruments off the balance, off balance sheets instruments. And now we're dealing with these intangibles. And as Peter writes in his book, the accumulation of this is is like a, a ticking time bomb. And it's about trying to build the research to help understand the, what methodology works. Um, so Peter, maybe you can elaborate on that a bit more, but I think that was well put, Julian, thank you. Um, yeah. Um... Well, I, you know, coming back to to the point of needing, you know, a a professional qualification um, to to bring this all together. I mean, there, there is certainly no no intention anywhere to invade the space occupied by established um, standard setters. I remember reading. Um, actually, it was talking to one of the master students in Durham after I finished the lecture. Um, she uh, she came up and uh, pointed a finger at uh, uh, an academic paper that she was working with. One of the authors was Andy Haldane, former um, chief economist at the Bank of England. And it, it made a statement that was clearly a statement of fact in their eyes. And I alluded to it in my opening remarks. And that statement was, a risk is inherently unobservable, only outcomes are observable. And I read that and I was quite taken aback because I thought to myself, well, profit is unobservable. Accountants make it observable using all the accounting techniques, experts, skills uh, that have evolved over, I'm going to say millennia. <laughs> um, uh, so you, you have this situation where I think we have an accounting profession um, that believes that statement so i think the contribution that we can make is look you know here is here is an approach a methodology a way of making what you thought was unobservable observable because that's what accountants do um so i think that to me that's that that is the 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 fundamental mess message here now once an organization like the iasb or the international, what are they? The International Sustainability Accounting Standards Board as well. Yeah. That's looking at now. If you go to them, because what what really scares me, bothers me greatly, that uh, everything I read, um, I think Julian alluded to uh, Harvard that have taken a qualitative approach. And if you take a qualitative approach to all this stuff, you default to disclosure outside the financial statements. That's what's going to happen. Uh, so it goes outside of the, the uh, accounting sphere. And if you go outside the accounting sphere, I think you tend to go outside the, the auditing sphere as well. I, I can't imagine how you would audit um, narrative and statistical disclosures made outside. I mean, how do you standardize them? This has got to be uh, of, of great concern. So I think if we can demonstrate in this particular area that... Um, and a, a risk is inherently observable because we have some accounting uh, practices and procedures that will make it observable. What kind of an effect would, will that have on these bodies that are trying to solve these world problems like the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board? Yes, I mean, I think, um, 
you know, ACCA, we, we are advocating for this convergence um, for more cohesion and so that there can be more comparability. Um, of, of, of course, as a trade body, we're trying to, to advance the profession by, by doing initiatives like this so that we don't go down the path of just um, having all these narratives. Of course, accountants are there, as you say, to make things observable, to put, to put a value in numbers on all these things that are intangible, as Steve has talked about. Um, but, you know, I think we have to be, we, we want to really stress that this isn't rewriting, this is researching what methods we can do to go about um, getting that. Um, it's not about critiquing um, what is out there, it's about trying to advance it. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, there's a lot of stake right now in society. And if you can't trust your accountant, who can, who can you? And, uh, you know, I think this is why it's really important that the accountancy profession starts really realizing their relevance to risk and, and, and how risk is all about um, strategy. Um, and, and, you know, stepping up to the plate, plate to kind of understand how you quantify for these and account for them more rather than talk about what those risks might be in a bigger picture. Otherwise, you know, we are going to be just going farther down this kind of green washing, white washing um, path that unfortunately it seems to be, you know, where we are <laughs> at this stage. Steve, maybe you can elaborate being a, a fellow ACCA yourself. Yeah, I was going to introduce a slightly different dimension, which is common sense. We have raised common sense today, but some of the most spectacular crashes in the last few years have been where organisations have taken on fixed price contracts and, and not realised that they were then going to be subject to things like statutory rises in pay. You, you don't have to be a genius to work out that you know, if it's costing you more to deliver than you're getting for, for, for your, your services, that's not a great future. Um, but that was so blinding obvious. And I just, I, I still really don't understand how, how you can avoid that just common sense. Uh, and, and that's, that's surely got a feature as well in, in some of these, some of these thoughts, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think the other thing about um, accountancy, too, is when I say step up to the plate is just asking a lot of these questions, hard to answer questions, um, maybe hard to uncomfortable ones that aren't easy to answer and and getting that kind of raised up to the, the board agenda. I mean, who doesn't want to have and when it comes to risk? And I know um, Justin will attest there's the, you know, the buzzword of the day is, is decision making. And who doesn't want to have better informed decision making? But you're not going to make better decisions if you don't know how to account for these and being able to quantify all of these, um, you know, intertwined um, intangible risks. So um, I hope everyone sees the path we're on and I'm look, looking forward tomorrow to hearing more about, um, you know, putting it to, into practice. I had one, one, well, I had two things I wanted to say, but one of them is meaningful and the other one was uh, slightly different. Um, so, I mean, just on cybersecurity, um, obviously anybody who looks at Apple will know I do a lot of stuff on cybersecurity. Um, uh, I'm the sort of associate editor of the Journal of Cybersecurity. So it's a kind of an interesting uh, area for me in terms of uh, operational risks. I, I wasn't overly surprised as, as uh, everybody else was on, on, on terms of that, um, because just the sort of the, the, the nature of the way cyber risks instantiate themselves and, uh, and, and a few other po points about how that works, it, it does tend to get lower sometimes as you move down to the more operational side of things. Uh, I'm sure if, you know, from a reputational front, you know, it can be sort of a big shock um, but if you actually look at the distribution of realized losses, sometimes actually it's, it's, it's slightly different from what one had expected. So a lot of it is mostly about, you know, uh, but you would probably then argue that it's about impact on your intangibles. And that could be actually much more uh, severe than, than what you're actually losing in terms of receipted losses if you think, or net, net adjusted losses if, if you were to go from a cyber insurance base. And then um, the last thing I just wanted to say was was just to say thank you so much to to Rachel and and Vicenza for being such a 
uh, fantastic and uh, uh, wonderful hosts and, and, and providing the sort of ambience and organization and just such a great sense of, uh, you know, collective, uh, you know, professionalism in how you go about doing all of these sorts of things. It's, it's, it's really wonderful. I, I've, I've sat in that position beforehand and you, you're, you're viewing and managing all sorts of things in different ways and, and you've done it with such great, uh, uh, oh, fantastic fun. grace and, uh, and, and good humour. So I just wanted to say thank you so much from my perspective. It was just wonderful just to watch everything as well as a participant as well as somebody who's uh, been actually speaking. Thank you very much. But no, thank you. This this is the most fun part of my job is being able to meet more members. So I hope anyone who wants to um, just offer any kind of like role that they're in as an accountant and becoming more um, more proactive from the risk perspective, um, I have been very um, delighted and, and interested in in meeting all of our um, ACCA members who are chief risk officers and. Um, I would have thought sort of like back in the Enron days, most of the chief risk officers, the few that they were as they were sprouting and coming about were came up more through the legal side or maybe compliance side. But I think you can see from the discussion today that we're seeing so many more. We have hundreds around the world um, who have accountancy backgrounds and how um, useful that is in today's climate. Um, so, you know, again, I think, you know, it's just this topic is so um, right now what, what we're dealing with in the world, so, so crucial. Um, so I hope that we can get you involved. And if you're shy and you'd rather contact via email, that, that's fantastic. Um, you know, we're happy to, to engage in, in, in any way anyone would like to in terms of coming and even just um, being involved uh, quietly or or offering some of, of your thoughts or your experiences. Um, I know um, in one of our North America um, risk events last year, there were quite a lot of internal auditors that, who were in on the rethinking risk. And they were, some of them were very candid um, about being able to verify uh, what's <laughs> some, some things that were in their statements and and talking about the frustration of that disconnect and misalignment. But I also through individual um, engagement have found North America to come a, a lot higher up this curve of, of bridging that disconnect than say over on this side of the, of the pond. I think um, a lot of the, our CROs and um, well, all, uh, all of our members in Europe, in Europe are grappling with more geopolitical and regulatory change than than anything, not to say that you aren't in the US and Canada, but I, I have seen a massive, if that's helpful to the panel um, through my engagement, a, a massive um, uh, leap in terms of uh, what a lot of our um, members in America are doing on, on the risk side. So um, thank you so much. For, uh, yeah. I was just going to kind of conclude as well. Uh, I think yeah, uh, I may, Rachel, which. Uh, just a few years ago, this would have been seen as some kind of fringe conversation. You know, I doubt we'd have had 50, 50 odd people come onto this kind of call. You know, It's now very much mainstream, very much. But you, when, you, when you've heard everything that's gone through today, there's gonna to be some massive winners and some massive losers. And I know which side of the coin I'd like to be on. So I think it's really, really important because what it says in when there's this kind of dynamic change and, and rationalization coming into any environment, there will be opportunities. And you know, the opportunities for the people on this call and our members, if we get it right, give them the right ammunition to go into battle with, they will be tremendously successful. Yeah, that's true. I mean, we've talked about how um, risk is all about taking, you know, adding value and taking on, you know, never, what's the expression, never miss the opportunity, the crisis presents kind of thing, or don't waste a crisis. Um, never waste a crisis. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I think it's almost five o'clock here, so that's why. <laughs> um, but, but yes, um, I do think for accountancy professionals, um, th this is a really a new era for us, and um, and that's why I'm really happy to be working with Premier and with Peter and Julian um, 
and their their colleagues on this. And I hope that you take advantage of, of this, you know, of the, this initiative and this collaboration to learn and try to get involved. Um, and um, I'm so pleased that 100% of you will be there tomorrow because I think it will be really interesting to talk about, you know, the, the um, putting it into practice more. Because um, I do find, I think accountancy professionals, they're used to having that everything be 100% right. And, 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 you know, this is kind of a, a very challenging um, new frontier with, with um, I think Steve was the one who used uh, back in 2022 with carbon it's like um measuring the carbohydrates and <laughs> on the coke cans like 25 years ago and how where they were then and where they are now in terms of getting that that better and better by the year <laughs> yes. yeah. well i think one of the interesting challenges again sorry to sort of come in with yet another conclusion is that um there's going to be some demographic interesting challenges here for our members and the guys we're hoping to kind of get on board using this this knowledge and these skills and whatever qualifications because we're typically going to see experts in mid-20s and it's going to be really important that they get taken seriously you know because they are by definition going to be the sources of knowledge of many of these things well, as we do our world tour uh, uh, for these workshops, I mean, I will. There are, like you say, and I think the the risk culture survey will certainly, hopefully, shine some light on these demographics and you know, um, on their on their findings. Because let's take Vietnam for example. I've talked quite. We in Nigeria is another growing risk market for us. We have um, C-suite members who are thirty years old. <laughs> um, and <Okay>. yes. <laughs> No, only joking. I definitely wasn't a CFO in the C-suite when I was <laughs> 30. But um, and so it, it will be interesting as we um, engage with members in different parts of the world and across different sectors. I think it makes sense to start with banking as Peter has, and that's what you know, with our talks with the CROs at Premier and at ACCA. Um, even the insurance CROs were coming on, weren't they, Peter saying that look, we want to look at what the banks are doing first because it is complex. It is a brave new world. Um, but that's why we're, we're holding these sessions to try to collaborate and share knowledge and network and see what others are doing to try to um, you know, make some sense of it. And we've got the risk accounting um, experts here to, to help us um, shape that. So um, again, I really, I really hope that everyone in the audience takes a, a, a bit away in that respect and um, and wants to get involved more. So, and uh, you know, I suspect too. You know, we're seeing, at, um, like we did in our CROs this morning, we were talking about how uh, companies, um, not just listed big companies that have chief risk officers, but um, we were talking about companies that we're engaging with who are SMEs um, and, um, and startups and how they're putting together kind of task force or management level committees. And perhaps that's something that when we get more uh, members from both associations on board more that we can see that companies might want to within their own organization, get a risk accountant, a, a risk accounting type um, management level group to talk about this and, and get more feedback from across the different um, teams. Because um, this is again, part of what we've been talking about all morning or afternoon is, is that misalignment. And, you know, Peter McConnell said that firsthand uh, as well, just that disconnect. And that's only gonna be more and more as things like ESG and all of the cyber and sustainability reporting requirements come on. Um, I have members in the in the states that they have come a long way, like I said, with their their I hate the word sustainability journeys, but the biggest challenge that any of the companies in the U.S. and Canada have told me is not getting the people interested. It's connecting the dots. Um, so I, I really do think you know something like learning more about risk accounting, how it works and, and working with your colleagues can be a, a good start to try to help you, you know, meet those objectives, get those dots connected. 
so that you're all singing from the same page. Any thoughts on that before we wrap things up again? <laughs> well, the last one for me would be we're gonna we're gonna be starting putting it, putting together a lot of knowledge and a lot of data, and the more we put in, the more the machine learning is is possible, mm -hmm. because we we as individuals will never ever have all the knowledge of everything we need. We are gonna have to be machine assisted. And the more we can collate that kind of data and knowledge and convert it into algorithm, algorithms that hopefully aren't biased, um, and that's going to be a big issue. Um, that that's going to be fundamental to the the tool set that we're going to need going forward. I just just sort of one extra point from from sort of my perspective, it would be that um, interfacing and you know effectively the how mechanisms interface in terms of information transfers are often the places where you know if you consider things where we're talking about operational risks here so when things go wrong we then do an ex post analysis of how could we have uh, uh, eliminated this and if we think about this from sort of all the many of the times it's oh well this person didn't talk to this person or this system didn't talk to this system or this measurement wasn't reflective of the true level of risk and um, so that interface and that uh, ability to to manage information flows in an effective way, such that the decision making. So that there was somebody I, I apologise who mentioned it before. There's only mentioned about decision tools and decision analysis. The decision making part of that has to ensure that it weighs up those pieces of information. Has to ensure that it's not downplaying certain pieces of information because they're inconvenient and then understanding how those information has been generated and what might be the issues that sort of sit underneath that. And, and that's a non-trivial thing to do. And that's why we continue to have the kinds of operational risks and the, the, the instances and in, in, in events that we observe. Um, you know, if, if we were doing this perfectly before, we probably would, well, almost certainly we would not observe many of the things that we have observed. And so we know that all of these things will be incomplete. They will never be a complete uh, barrier to all events there. But the better that we understand the mechanisms and the causal design of these things, the better we will be able to actually design uh, structures that will manage those risks and allow people to take sensible levels of risk and actually design things in a way whereby we can characterize risk appetites versus realized risks that are of a comparable level rather than uh, unexpectedly being faced with higher risks than we thought we had, or maybe paying a lot of money to mitigate risks that we don't actually uh, have. So, you know, those two things are also uh, issues that, that, that pop up. So I think that that's a, a key point that, that, that uh, Rachel, that you've, you've really sort of hit upon there in terms of like uh, why this is a complicated subject. It's also probably why it's a little bit of a scary subject that it's a subject that's not, not easy to sort of um, to, to digest and understand relative to a series of sort of more stratic and structured things that we would look at in terms of, you know, prior audit of past, uh, um, you know, past economic activity. So I thought I'd just mention that and say yeah, no, how- that's really well put. That, that actually would have been useful to, to contribute to the CROs this morning. Um, I mean, a lot of the um, financial services CROs, what keeps them up at night is the concentration on the cloud. It's what they tell us. And, and so we were talking about um, all these things you were saying, just about getting those, those how accountancy CROs with accountancy backgrounds can help um, understand what those thresholds of tolerance should be when you know making the, the cyber risk assessments and risk, uh, risk appetite statements. Um, and that was why they were talking when it came to the three lines about how CROs need to be across all three lines now. Um, and, and how there needs to be dotted line with the, the, the accountants and the finance teams as Peter's gone on, how separate they've always been, like dotted lines coming into the CFO and CRO and having the CRO and CFO working more. And, and if you're at a smaller company then the, the finance function and say maybe the compliance function working more together to be able to share this data and make some sense of, of, of what it is. And this is what we're trying to, when it when we say making sense, is making some kind of reliable, workable methodology given this, this risk landscape. And as all of these um, operational, non-financial, 
um, environmental and people risks accumulate, um, you know, how, how we're going to provision, plan, and, um, and remain resilient.